Ragthang Airflits, and welcome to another episode of the 2000 AD Thrillcast. We truly are back on schedule. I am Molchar, the brand manager for 2000 AD, and your host for this episode. Thank you to well, to everyone who's given feedback on the last couple of, uh, of episodes. If you haven't listened to the new and improved 2000 AD Thrillcast, then head along to 2000AD.com forward slash podcasts uh, and uh, catch up on our uh, interview with Simon Harrison uh, last uh, in the last episode, which has got an absolutely fantastic amount of feedback. So thank you to everyone who really enjoyed that. It seems to have um, really struck a chord with lots of people. Um, and uh, as always, it was fantastic to be able to talk to him. So this episode has a bit more of a sombre subject as John M. Burns, one of our most beloved artists, passed away just before New Year. And we wanted to take this opportunity to pay tribute to him. Uh, how to describe John? I mean, his career spans decades i mean from um you know working as an apprentice on titles like school friend and junior express um he worked on eagle wham diana uh the seekers george and lynn and jane uh, which were the, the 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 incredibly popular newspaper strips um uh, things like modesty blaze but it was uh, for, for many people they remember him from the 1970s when he was working on uh, tv action countdown and look in which was all the the tv uh, tie-in strips so doctor who uh, the old mission impossible buck rogers magnum pi and it wasn't until the 90s that he began work uh, really for 2000 ad and for my money, became one of the Judge Dread artists whose work I look forward to the most. He managed to make the future believable. Uh, there was a, a, a wonderful synthesis of um, kind of old school futurism uh, and a down to earth grittiness that just made his Mega City One feel really uh, lived in. Um, and then when he started work on Nikolai Dante, also in the 90s, the incredibly long running and a futuristic uh, uh, Russian swashbuckler. Um, that, again, really played to his strengths. You know, you, you, you had a harking back to uh, the, 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 yeah, the swashbuckling films of the 1940s and 1950s, a love of costume, just an incredible eye for detail, uh, emotion, character, pathos. Um, so, you know, we, we, we've, we've been incredibly blessed um, at 2000 AD with John's work for, for such a long time and his most recent work on uh, The Order with Keck W showed no loss in quality uh, and, that, and that's, I think that's what's most remarkable about John's career um, is right up until the end he was producing just absolutely sublime painted artwork um, so on uh, this episode we have got a bit of a panel discussion from people who knew uh, and worked with John um, just to discuss his life, his work, what he was like as a person and the legacy that he leaves behind. So um, we have um, Tim Quinn, um, who uh, has worked with John um, uh, on many things, in including the revival of Jane uh, in uh, the newspaper strip in the 1990s. Um, Sean Phillips, who's uh, you know uh, has worked with John, but also, also is a great admirer uh, of his work. Um, Robin Morrison, who was the writer on Nikolai Dante, and Paul Duncan, who knew John and is uh, currently working on a, a, a book about him, which should be absolutely fascinating. So, a wonderful opportunity to just just relish um, the remarkable body of work that uh, John has left us with and also the, the the lasting impressions that he left on the people that he knew so um we'll crack on with the uh with the panel in, in a second thank you so much to everybody uh, like I said who is uh, uh, enjoying the return of the thrillcast please do subscribe uh on whatever podcast uh, app you uh, prefer um we're also on youtube and 2080.com do help spread the word when you see our posts on social media so we can bring more people into the fold of 2000 AD. but without much further ado let's uh, crack on with uh, our discussion with tim quinn robbie morrison uh, sean phillips and paul duncan about the life work and legacy of john m burns
So it's wonderful to be able to welcome uh, four amazing guests to our little roundtable discussion about John Burns, his work and his legacy. Uh, I am very pleased to welcome uh, Tim Quinn, Sean Phillips, Robbie Morrison and Paul Duncan to uh, uh, to this uh, roundtable. So uh, thank you all for, for, for joining me on this. Um, I want I want to start off by uh, by talking to Tim. Oh my. Uh, about John, um, because I, 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 I mean, I, I think out of everybody, you're the person who, who knew him the most, who I had the the the, the most um, contact with him. Oh really? Okay. T t tell us a little bit about your your uh, about John, your your work with John, your relationship with John. Uh, well, I loved him from the word go, even before I knew who the hell he was. Uh, you know, as a kid back in the sixties. Um, for some reason, I was given a Laramie, Laramie Annual, which was a famous Western TV series, and uh, John's work was in there. And um, I found myself copying it. Um, I don't quite know why. I just did. So that's, that's kind of my earliest memory um, of um, being affected by John's work. And then um, I was particularly struck when um, Wham! comic came out, Leo Baxendale's Brainchild, and uh, one of my favourite pieces in there was Kelpie, <laughs> the uh, boy wizard. I, just, I mean, I, I've always loved everything to do with King Arthur and stories set in that time, uh, but this one was just so perfect, uh, uh, particularly if you were, how old was I? 10, I guess, 11 maybe, um, in 1964. Um, it was just perfect. It was it was a huge leap on from the Laramie Annual, that's for sure. Um, and it was just walking into this magical world. Um, and, and quite amazing, really, thinking back, that it was just two pages a week. You know, to be able to capture so much in in, in those two pages was incredible. Uh, yeah, I was transported every week. And it, it was a huge part of my week in 64 to actually um, uh, go to the news agents on the way back from school and pick up Wham um, and um, immediately read it as soon as I got home. Uh, and uh, much as I love Leo's stuff uh, and Ken Reed in there, um, I think I, I really was buying it mainly for Kelpie, um, which, which uh, still to me, well, it, it, you know, it's one of those things, if it gets you as a kid, um, all these years later, it still got me. Whenever I see pages from that, it gives me that uh, buzz, that 1964 buzz. So, I, of course, it, it wasn't signed, so I wouldn't have known. I don't think I knew that that was John until um, uh, way later in 1978 when um, Dennis Gifford had a uh, comic book convention at the Y Hotel in uh, London. And uh, John was one of the guests. And Leo was launching his autobiography. Uh, it's a funny business then. And I think that went into detail and, and, and featured Kelpie at, at some point. So I guess I would have clicked that then. And, and indeed, I do remember at that convention meeting and talking with John. Um, uh, and suddenly realising all the stuff that he'd done, <laughs> which... Um, which I should have got. I guess I was never particularly great at spotting styles, you know, but then his, his was a developing style throughout, really, wasn't it? So so I guess now I, I can sort of be forgiven at that tender age for not quite being able to figure it out until there it was on the printed page. Um, so that, that was quite, that was one hell of a convention. Uh, and in fact, whenever I think of comic conventions, and I've, I've been to a zillion of them now. Um, the very best one was that one in 19, 1978. I think it was called Comics 101 or something along those lines. And um, it was very British. Um, just about everybody in, in British comics were there. Um, and I think the only people from the States were the Mad Crew uh, from Mad Magazine and uh, Des Skin, who was pushing... Um, the work he was doing at Marvel at the at Marvel UK at the time, um, but I came away with Leo's book 
and um, a greater understanding of John and a real desire to work with him at some point, but quite how the hell I would manage to achieve that, because I think at that point I was just working for the Beano and Dandy. I, I, I hate to say just, because, of course, they were wonderful <coughs> comics. And Bunty. I was indeed the man from Bunty for a while. Um, uh, so it wasn't until later that um, working with John actually came up, which would have been, and probably uh, Paul has, <laughs> Paul, Paul, I will probably go to him for, uh, when the hell was that, Paul? <laughs> As my brain gets foggy with dates. Um, because the first time I worked with John would have been on the Jane strip in the Daily Mirror, um, which was, was, uh, uh, years later and then we really met um properly um uh in that uh once i was working for the mirror i was invited to the wonderful um lunches uh down the strand um at a italian I can't remember the name of the restaurant but uh, on the corner down the strand and um i remember the very first meeting which was with john allard um, and um, John Burns and Morris Dodd from the pa Parishes. And it was just like, for me, it was just like being in heaven, you know. It was such a, a glorious um, bunch of people who who had, through my whole life, I'd been there through my whole life, really, um, you know, uh, uh, their work um, I, I loved. Um, so that, that was, uh, I remember that first meeting, and, and I remember... John was very, I, I suppose the word, uh, curmudgeonly um, throughout it, um, especially in respect to uh, John Allard, um, who, and I love John Allard. He was wonderful. Um, and I still live, love him to this day, um, as long as I don't look at some of the script changes he made on some of my scripts um, down the years. <laughs> Uh, but, but you know, it, it was, I guess it was a great learning process because up till that point, I hadn't done any daily strips. And um, John, of course, had done a, a zillion. John Allard had done a zillion. Um, so, so there was bound to be a certain clash of this youngish guy, me, and, uh, <laughs> sorry, John, this old codger, John Allard. Um, uh, but... I, I don't. I don't think I. I don't think I kicked up a stink ever. Although I, I was close to it once, um, purely because of John's long-standing in 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 comics. You know, it was like and and my natural feeling of how lucky am I to be working on the mirror strips um, with these guys. Um, I, I probably only became more curmudgeonly myself later in life. Um, so I can blame John Burns for that. I, I followed. Him. That, that's, that, that, that now is... I'm I am horrible to work with now. <laughs> <laughs> Self awareness is important. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I mean, reading interviews with him, um, you, you'd be forgiven for him coming off uh, coming across as curmudgeonly, and yet there the, there still seems uh, yeah. It's not an insult as well, by well, the way. It's not an insult. exactly. Quite the, 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 the passion there. You know, it's yeah. it's it's kind of based around his desire, seemingly his desire. I mean, you know, I, I interviewed. Well, no, it, it came from working with utter twats <laughs> in the comic book industry, I think. Uh, and uh, it, I mean, you 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 meet them, you know. Yeah. Uh, as, as some of these editors leave a lot to be desired. Um, uh, in my humble opinion, um, which is why I became an editor in comics in the first place, because I couldn't understand what the hell these guys were doing to my stuff. And I thought, well, maybe if I get inside, I'll, I'll get some inner, you know. Uh, and, and it was only when I was inside, I realized, ah, they're just complete nitwits. Um, so, <laughs> so I got it. I got with, I got uh, John's angst mm -hmm. um, at, uh, you know, I mean, because by that bloody hell, John's were, just hire him and let him do the bloody job, will you? You know, and that was always my way of being an editor, hiring the right people and then saying, right, let me know if there's anything you need and now get on with it. And, you know, here's the here's a writer that ho hopefully you will find um, appealing and will work well with you. Yeah. Um, it's that simple. It's not bloody brain surgery, is it? You know, well, I mean, that's something I want to ask Robbie about because 
you know the the, the last um few decades of John's life you know he, he he seemed to find this natural home at 2000 AD and and yeah, yeah. um you know particularly uh Matt Smith is known as an editor who's very much you know the script is done there's the script you 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 do it do you think that's why he found 2000 AD a, a bit of a natural home and what was your experience with working with him on on Nikolai Dante for I mean years wasn't it yeah about three years on um uh yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I, yeah, people had told me initially he could be quite curmudgeonly and stuff, but I never really found that. And I guess it's just, you know, we seemed to get on. And I respect, I mean, I hugely respected him, of course, as a, a, you know, looking back, I should probably have been daunted that, oh no, I've got John Burns drawing my scripts. I better pull my socks up. But obviously the, the arrogance of youth and stuff like that, you can, you can, power, you can power through. But I, I just don't think he suffered fools gladly, and I and I suspect if you were writing scripts that he wasn't happy with, he would have, you know, he'd have moved on. Um, I mean, I used to I used to call him up every now and again whenever we were starting another big stretch of the storyline, and um, I would call him up and I chat with him, and you know, we would have a bit of a laugh. But uh, and sometimes, but you know, usually he would moan like, "Oh, this this stuff's all a bit too serious. It's it's getting quite heavy." So then I would write him a short couple of humorous episodes and then we'd be like, oh, this stuff's a bit lighthearted. We need to do some, get get more serious and get, uh, you know, um, you know, stronger storylines in us, you know, more powerful plots. Mm. But really, I think, I think a lot of it was just, he just, he enjoyed what he was doing and it was, he might even have just been winding me up a lot of the time, you know, because, um, uh, I mean, he was just a, I just think he was a brilliant artist, uh, sort of, classic the last of a certain generation of, of artists you know I mean to if I can go off on a wee tangent and go back um some of the first comics my granddad ever bought me were uh issues of TV action in which John was doing drawing old uh, TV shows adaptations like UFO and Mission Impossible and Canon and I just loved these artwork from day one and in some ways I look back on it and think a lot of those comics that I was um reading at that time probably inspired me to go and become a writer in the long run. So, you know, fast forward, you know, 25 or 30 years. And um, while I was doing Nikolai Dante for 2000 AD, I think John had been one of my first original suggestions as a possible artist for the series. And I can't remember why, but the, the editor didn't, uh, didn't, didn't want to go there for, for whatever reason. Maybe they were just happy having John on Judge Dredd. I think he was mainly doing it at that point. But obviously John didn't like the hard science fiction stuff of Judge Dredd. So eventually it turned out he asked, um, I think it was David Bishop was the editor at that point. He asked David Bishop, oh, could I, could I maybe draw some of this Nikolai Dante series? Because obviously it's that sort of, Dante had that retro-futuristic, classic adventure strip feel, which is always what I was aiming for and which, you know, John was perfect for that sort of thing. So um, it was just a huge thrill for, you know, someone who that I, I had been reading and admiring, he's reading his comics and admiring his artwork since I was about five. In fact, since before I could read and I had to have them read to me. Um, and then to end up working with them for such a long period on you know, like Nikolai Dante and then the Bendati Vendetta was just, yeah, it really was. It was terrific. I mean, I still look at it as it's probably one of the most, you know, I've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of great artists, but, you know, John was certainly one of the sort of most satisfying creative collaborations that we worked on, you know, and I still remember that, the the, the very first eight-parter that he drew, there's a the pages two and three of it are a gigantic uh, double-page splash of Nikolai Dante leading the troops in battle and he's diving over a barricade and cannon blasts everywhere, swords swinging. And it, it's just a beautiful piece of artwork. And, it you know, it just, I can't, um, to this day, it's sort of it's like, you know, you sort of think, I wrote that. But, <laughs> you know, it's like, no, but John drew it, if you know what I mean. That's yeah. that's it's the artist to visualise this, this, this stuff. So, um, yeah, it was just, uh, it was, I just always, he never, you know, he never skimped. And you could tell yeah. he was never any lazy hour, never skimped. You know, he wasn't, wasn't one of these artists who just 
put blacks everywhere and and, and tried to try to hide behind a, a noirish style, Mister Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, I mean, you, you just say that, but I was going to come to Sean and say, Sean, how did John Burns influence your work? Um, I am only joking, of course. He influenced me right at the beginning when I first when I was first starting out. Um, I knew his stuff from looking. I was a bit too young for Countdown, or, or actually, I just wasn't interested in anything that wasn't a Marvel comic. And I I would read Looking occasionally when he drew the Bionic Woman and stuff like that. Um, so and then I I started working for Bunty right at the beginning as well. So to learn how to draw women or young girls, you know, John was a big influence definitely for that that sort of um, wholesome look he managed to get. And sometimes steady was, on, Sean. Sorry, steady on. <laughs> no, I mean John could draw when he did a I can't remember what the title was something about time travel, like a a teenage time traveling girl. Um, Glory was, night, the glory night, yeah. So that sort of bouncy, innocent-looking stuff was a, yeah, was good. Not his like Jane. I couldn't use that when I was drawing Bunty. That was for sure. <laughs> well, yeah. he, he, I mean, he had such a, a, a remarkable career, not not just in in terms of its longevity, but also the just the the, the the different stuff that he he did. You know, go, going all the way back to um, kind of the beginning of his career. And he's doing something like the Wrath of the Gods, um, but also you know there's 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 the newspaper strips, there's the 2000 AD stuff, you know there's the 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 TV the you know the looking stuff that, that that you mentioned there. I mean that to have a style that is instantly recognisable across the board, you know you you always recognise when when John Burns is is drawing or, or painting something. That that that's a hell of a thing for an artist over what sixty. 60 odd years, isn't it? I mean, he could just draw really well, couldn't he? So that just shone through everything. And like you said, you know, even if he didn't really particularly like what he was drawing, like sci fi, or whatever, he didn't skimp, he still put all the effort in, hmm. did the research, made it all look totally believable. And it, it, because you, you started off um, in girls' comics um, uh, at the very beginning of your, 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 your career. Um, what, what were the fundamental lessons? That you you would take from something like John's work, um, know, just just the fact that it was different to um, the Marvel stuff I was really into. Mm. You know, it was it was very British. Um, I, I don't know what that how, but it just was. Um, and it, you know, like I say, you could draw anything and make it look convincing. And it was it was good because when I had a draw for Bunty and stuff like that, I'd be drawing schoolgirls or gymnasts or Victorian orphans and stuff it's quite um sedate stuff something you know it's a lot harder to draw someone sat in a chair than flying through the sky mm. so you know John did could do all that stuff you know it, I, it, I was it, always, so go on. oh no I was, I was I was always amazed with it when you saw his looking and, and TV action stuff and this is something I always get with a lot of artists is that he could do likenesses Brilliantly, he could always, which as a child and you're watching, you're watching the TV show and then you're reading the comic, you want them to look like the, the characters. Yeah. And he could do amazing likenesses of 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 the actors that he was drawing. But at the same point, he still made it his own. It was his version of them rather than something that was too distinctly photo referenced. And, and it always amazes me. I mean, it amazes me that actually the artists can make characters look consistent from panel to panel because... It, it, just <laughs> yeah. that in itself is, is, you know, beyond beyond my uh, painful. Oh, I mean, I think, in fact, you know, with John drawing the TV stuff back then, it's before video recorders, before DVDs. Right. He he mm -hmm. would have been, you know, they would have given him like you know half a dozen photos maybe of of Lindsay Wagner as the Barnet Woman, and then he'd have to, you know, figure out what she looked like without, yeah. her, you know, without using the photos over and over and over again. I, I really enjoyed the um, um, in David Bishop's interview with him for the magazine years ago. Now um, he said he, he got hired to do a um, a comic strip about the royals, um, about the royal family, and yeah. he said um, it was only when I had these piles and piles of reference that I've been sent that I realised how wonky all of their faces are. <laughs> <laughs> Which, That's what 
distinctive, you know. You, yeah. it's a, a, a symmetrical face is a, lot, is a lot harder to do, much more boring to look at. Yeah. It, yeah, it, I mean, I think in John, uh, oh, sorry, he was, he was brilliant in drawing beautiful women and drawing, you know, heroic uh, leading characters. Uh, but he was also, what I always loved is, you know, he could make, you know, background characters or you know he could he could really do caricature people with really you know ugly characters in the background and really interesting characterful faces at the same time. I mean he you know he, he essentially he could pretty much do anything I I reckon. So I mean we, talking about beautiful women, Tim, because you, you you worked with him on, on the revival of Jane for for the um uh, the Daily Mirror, didn't you? And yes, it was a newspaper once. Yeah. <laughs> well, talk, talking about comic books, it's perfect. Um, J Jane is is um, uh, a, a bit by, a bit like George and Lynn. Is is one of those like the vast majority of people who will have read those um, newspapers wouldn't necessarily know who John Burns is or or or, or know about his wider work, but they'd instantly recognise. Um, the, the the comic strip. What was it like working with him on on um, a, a, a revival of of that character? Uh, well, for me, as somebody who just loves comics and loves the history of comics, it was you know wonderful to to suddenly be doing Jane in the Mirror. If you'll pardon the expression, was uh, a delight, and and to be working with John Burns. Um, I mean, it, it was, and we we did get on. I think from the word go, from that first lunch. Um, to such an extent that whenever I would say, uh, we, whenever I came up with an idea, not for Jane, but for something else, a new idea, he would say, okay, let's give that a go. And I was always amazed when he would send me the pages very swiftly as well, very, very quick. You know, So I'd send a script over for a, an opening of a story and he would send me uh, the artwork and he, so here were these brand new characters, but they were so well developed already. It was as if he'd been working on this for years and years and years and years, these characters for years and years, you know, whereas with other artists, it naturally takes a certain amount of time to hit that stage of development with, with, with new characters. So that, that was quite extraordinary. I, th I find in, in all the work that I've done with a zillion wonderful artists, um, that was something that John's work was just instantly like, it was as if it was three years into the strip. And yet it was the first page or first few pages that he'd created. So that that was exciting. I, I think that both of it, well, I, I don't think, I know that both of us were a bit um, frustrated with the direction that we were instructed to take Jane in, um, in the mirror. We wanted it to be um, a much freer, uh, we, want, we wanted to be much freer. Um, but I, I seem to remember um, that word had come down from Robert Maxwell about the directions the strip should take. Which, which is quite bizarre, really, to think that he had an input of any kind into anything other than falling off the side of a ship. Um, or people's uh, pensions. <laughs> I'm sorry? Or people's pensions. And well, not to mention people's <laughs> pensions, yes. Um, it, the atmosphere at the Mirror did change sort of overnight when he walked in. Um, and it, <laughs> I remember <laughs> a sure sign that, some, that things are not going to go right was when he had a helipad put on the roof of the Mirrors building in Holborn. Uh, and it, there was just something of the James Bond villain uh, about that, you know, bear in mind that it's so many bloody years ago now. Um, uh, so so John and I were, were we, we, knew, we loved the strip. We loved Jane the strip. We loved its history. And we wanted to do so much better on it. Um, I mean, I look back on it now and I've, I've read a few of the stories uh, and they're OK. They are OK. I mean, they look great, first of all. But um, but, but yeah, yeah, there's that frustration still that this is such a fabulous historical character um, that deserved a bit better than than. Um, and by the time they started colouring it up, of course, um, uh, when the mirror uh, brought in um, a pack of 
felt tips. Um, I think John did lose heart in the strip. Um, not that it showed, not, not that it, sh maybe it showed a little bit, um, but it, certainly it showed whenever we met up, um, his, his frustration at it, which did allow us to, to, or did allow me to then say, what about this? What about this? Should we try this? Should we try this? So, so any number of ideas came up because of that, which, uh, we, we attempted to push out there, um. I was always surprised when when an idea featuring John's work didn't get picked up. Um, there was something we did for um, GQ magazine. It was having Gentlemen's Quarterly. It was being relaunched. And um, I made contact with them and said, uh, graphic novels are the big thing, you know, of now. Um, why don't we do a couple of pages of strip each month? And, you know, and the, the end result will be you can bung out a graphic novel. And uh, let's do something uh, like uh, something that's timeless, like Sherlock Holmes. So we put together a page of uh, Sherlock Holmes artwork, which uh, which is oh, so one of the most beautiful pages of artwork I've ever seen in my life. Um, and um, I thought, oh, well, this is a definite sale. And we went to the offices of this. Uh, I guess this must have been the 90s by now. And this very trendy young guy there. Um and he just took one look at it and said, no, this wouldn't work in army. Um, and so we were out of the door in like two minutes. Uh, and I, I just remember being stunned that somebody would treat John that way. Um, and I brought that up with him and he said, oh, this is just the business. This is the business, Tim. Mm. Yeah, this, is, uh, this is the business. So, I mean, he he, he was well aware of that, I'm sure. But, uh, uh, but for me as as somebody who absolutely adored his work and had that respect for it. Um, but you know, that's the problem, isn't it? Art and selling it. Um, you walk into this uh, absurd sort of area. Um, uh, so and, and, and it didn't phase him, um, but it phased me in that, you know, I still think what the hell is wrong with these people? Uh, especially when I look at that artwork today and it's, you know, it's as timeless a piece of artwork as you can can imagine, um, and uh, I would <laughs> I would love to see the second page <laughs> and the third page. So you know, you're that's one of the, feeling that that is one of the things about John's artwork. Though it is kind of timeless. It's good, you know. It's yeah. he could it could almost be you know drawn at the same time as Alex Raymond back doing Flash Gordon. It has that yeah. classic yeah. timeless feel, which I don't think ever dates. I mean, you know, it, it's just. It's just beautiful to look at. Yeah, it, I mean, he he cited um, Norman Rockwell as an inf you know when when he was younger and he he, he wanted to. Oh, draw really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's interesting because for many many years I worked as the humor editor at the Saturday Evening Post magazine, right. and one of the delights of working there over in Indianapolis was that my office walls, unlike today, were covered in Norman Rockwell originals. Um, mm. I can really see that. I can see that being an inspiration for John, but I, yeah. I never, never heard that. Huh. Yeah, it, well, it, it, I think it, it, he. That's when he switched from wanting to draw comics to being an illustrator. So, and mm. for me, there was always that tension in his stuff between illustration and the storytelling that he did really well. That you know, you, you you've kind of mashed these two things up. I, I, I want to turn to Paul, who's been sat very patiently there as as we've talked away, um, because you're 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 working on something of a gargantuan project um, based around uh, John and his work. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I, actually, I met John in the 1980s. I did a magazine oh. called Arc Arc and Sword. Mm. And uh, in fact, I spent three, four years trying to get an interview with him <laughs> uh, at, at that time. Um, and you should have offered them money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this this was the 80s. This is fandom. What, what can I say? Mm. But, but I think that, um, I, I mean, I grew up, like everybody here, I grew up reading John Burns, uh, the first thing I remember is Tomorrow People in Look and Learn, uh, sorry, in Looking, and uh, I loved the TV show, and what the comic strip could do, 
that the TV show couldn't do is that it could take you to outer space. You could see monsters. You could, and it all seemed so real. And that, that was the thing that really grabbed me about his work in that, uh, as, as everybody was saying before, it looked modern, uh, it looked ageless, but it also looked like it was from the future. It didn't, it, 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 it seemed now, it seemed really immediate and it really gripped me. And um, so when he did Space 1999 and, um, uh, and Bionic Woman, those were great. Uh, Book Rogers he did, Smuggler, How the West Was Won. In, in black and white, some of the best black and white I've I've ever seen from from John, and also his name was signed on the artwork, so that you knew who it was. So, so when I saw all that, I mean, I I, I said I have to find everything by this guy. When I started my fanzine, Arkansas, I made it my mission to try and find this guy and to interview him and to. And and to grab him. And um, uh, long story short, uh, David Lloyd managed to, who was a great friend uh, to the to the magazine, got me in contact with him. And three years it took me to persuade him to to do an interview. And really, when I met him, he was very very reticent. It was him and Julia, his his wife. And uh, I met them in in a hotel in London, and um, they were there because they loved all these uh, uh, musicals on the West End. So every now and again, they would travel from Cornwall to the West End in order to see these uh, these musicals and do meetings and things like that. And I I sat down, and virtually everything I asked John, it was like, well, it's it's just a job, you know. It's it, he didn't seem to have any, if you like, agency in what he was doing. It, it seemed very strange to me. And uh, luckily, over the past um, few years, uh, I got back in contact with, with John and Julia, and I I spent a couple of weeks um, in Cornwall with them in in the studio, watching John uh, work. And um, uh, and really, I think that John was both uh, a total professional in everything that he'd do. He knew everything about everything he, he drew. He, he would research everything. Uh, he had memorized how to do certain things over 50 years, 60 years, that's what you do. Um, he had complete control over his hands, his instruments, the board, everything that he, he had, he had complete control over it. And, uh, and also he was completely absorbed by everything he was doing. Um, so the, the way that what we would do is that I, I would be in the studio um, scanning his artwork for I'm doing an enormous book um, on John, which luckily he um, uh, I, I did dummy layouts and luckily he was able to see it and um, before he passed uh, and flow through it. Um, and uh, what uh, so I would do be scanning in the morning. There was a, a set routine during his day. Uh, he would go for the newspaper at nine. He would have a, um, a cup of tea and biscuits at 10.30. Uh, 12.30, break for lunch. We, we would sit down. He would, um, uh, and then because I was there, he would talk and talk. He refused to be interviewed, refused to be recorded because he was so self-conscious about this. And this was really, I think, part of the reason why he had refused me um, previously in the, in the 1980s, because he was very uh, self-conscious and uh, he didn't like to put himself forward in that way. He didn't like public speaking or, or anything like that, which is fine. And, um, uh, and it was then that he would really open up uh, and tell me stories. Now, 
I asked him about uh, drawing and he said, you know, for while he's out the board, right, uh, at the end of the day, sometimes he's completely uh, drenched in, in sweat because, because his uh, concentration on what he's doing is so intense for the day that he would he would not only be uh, drawing, right? He'd also be planning the different layers of of the drawing, so that not only what you could see and compose, but also um, for the visual effect, for the effect that he could visualize in it in his mind. How is he going to achieve it? What techniques is he going to need in order to get that image onto the page? What's like any painter, you've got to decide what colors you're gonna put in the back and what you're going to put on top, how you're going to make a particular highlight. Are you going to use particular uh, materials? You're gonna use wax or uh, a different, uh, um, um, you know, so all of this is going through his mind as he's drawing. And that's why he was so, so focused while he was uh, he was on the board. So, I mean, that was absolutely um, f fascinating, you know, to uh, to be there while he was while he was going through that. And then for each stage of the of of the story, if something was easier and he knew how to do it and it was easy, he would then just put on music. You'd be putting on um, uh, music from the 40s and 50s, swing, jazz and stuff like that. Or he'd be putting on uh, uh, the musicals, West End musicals uh, and all that sort of stuff. And loud, really, really loud. It was, uh, yeah, but I mean, so, so the experience for being there really, it taught me that this was everything that he wanted to do. That was, that was his complete life. He was, um, he was just uh, obsessed um, to draw and keep on uh, drawing. And uh, so then when it came to 5.30, that was knocking off time and go to eat. And then it was, he's, he's uh, watching television and um, and he loved all the the things that interest him, him, which you could see on his walls. He had books of reference and everything. Um, but he said the things that he loved to to watch were like old costume dramas. Uh, this is why, uh, if you look at his work on, he did two classic comics, um, Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights. And those I consider to be some of his very, very best work because he really put everything that he uh, he felt about. He really loved that subject. He also loved Nicolai Dante. You know, but that was just like, I feel uh, of, of his later work, it was the absolute ideal subject matter for him. He loved all those Errol Flynn, um, uh, movies, Robin Hood, and uh, you know, Burt Lancaster and Black Pirate, all this sort of stuff. And um, he loved all that, where the um, where the central character is both um, um, uh, is is both entertaining, he's humorous, but also there's a, a serious. It can switch to a serious side. It can he can he can get that. Um, uh, emotion, you know, in the same way that um, uh, a lot of, uh, if you like, if you go back to uh, the war, World War II, I'm talking about here, a lot of people who live through that, you get through those hard times by the humour. It's not the, that the character is humorous and then has a serious side. It's that the characters are serious, but they hide their seriousness through their humour. And John just got all that. He just understood it. He couldn't articulate it in in interviews, but he could articulate it 
on the page. Mm. And um, yeah, so uh, I just think he was a wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. uh, artist and uh, and an artist who who never depleted. He never got worse. He improved and changed. Uh, as he went through his career and every single decade there is great great work and um, there's there's no falling off you know stuff that he did you know in the 1960s like like this this is from the seekers in around uh, uh, late 60s is is just wonderful as is you know the the later work that he that he did was was fully painted, so no, I you know he's you know he's a grandmaster, and uh, you know I you know uh, I don't think we'll see a like his like again really. I mean, it, 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 something I want to pick up on there is, it, you know, he he got to a grand old age. He didn't stop working until what was it, the October um last year before he passed yeah. away which is absolutely remarkable to have a career of 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 that length and to um and this is something i, I, I specifically would like to talk to to to, to tim and, and and robbie about it um he was largely self-taught in the you know he 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 came through the education system and then ended up at um uh, the old agencies where you would learn by basically copying the artists who who were there but most importantly for me, and I, I think this might have something to do with the the, the the source of the realism of his work, is he was working class. This was a you know this was an East End kid who'd run around the bomb sites of um, the East End of London during the war, and to what, all intents and purposes was a self-made man. I mean, it, it, with with these, did you ever get the sense of of um, a, a, a kind of humility to him that the perhaps the curmudgeonness kind of uh, <laughs> clouded over. Yeah, I think I think a lot of what Paul was saying there was was true, and that you know he, he could be quite humble and quite uh, self deprecating, but the passion was in the artwork. You could just you could just see it in every you know every. Every line of ink and every brush stroke, the the passion was in there. So you you can see it. And I remember, um, yeah, I think that's he obviously had a a, a training for want of a better uh, term as an artist that really doesn't exist anymore. I don't think in any ways. I mean, I remember the first time I ever met John, my partner Deborah and I went out with, with him and his wife Julia. We had a meal. I think it was one of the Bristol conventions, one of the early ones. And it was just fascinating to sit and listen to him. First of all, you know, talk about his national service in Singapore. And then when he came back, I think he was basically essentially an apprentice artist in a studio, you know, as as you said, learning from other, you know, terrific artists of the time. And it was like it was a kind of a it was a snapshot of a of a time of a comics industry that well, when there was a a, a comics industry, so to speak, of that um you you just won't see that again, you know, and it's it's um yeah for somebody from his the background you've sort of said to be able to get into that without having to go into art school or without having to go through anything was quite uh yeah quite quite amazing um and yeah Tim what 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 are your thoughts on well I was never conscious of his class. Uh, I was, but then I've never been one to look down on him because he's working class or look up to him because he's whatever the hell he is. Um, uh, I, I mean, everything that Paul said uh, is is bang on uh, about uh, John's work. Uh, and it is all the more staggering when you actually start looking into it. Um, and it is all the more sad when you realise that... Um, uh, artists of today will will not have that background. <laughs> I mean, you know, even going back, well, going back as far as the 50s, sort of when I started picking up magazines and uh, comic books, um, there were hundreds of the bloody things, you know, they, they were everywhere. And there were so many opportunities for people to um, 
get in as artists or writers, um, um, even on through the 60s and uh, into the 70s, you know, when um, I remember personally not wanting to put all my eggs in one basket uh, 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 and uh, starting to do interviews with people for newspapers and magazines. And because I'd started at DC Thompson, that was as great a place as any to to, to um, allow you to um, grow uh, in so many different ways, you know, because of their magazines and uh, newspapers and comic books. Um, so it was, it was indeed, you know, they say that the past is a different country. I mean, it's a different bloody universe as soon as you get back to the uh, 60s and 50s, certainly. Um, and, you know, just pick up an old copy of um, uh, Punch and look at the variety of wonderful styles in that, you know, from the 40s and 30s and 50s. Um, and not only in the cartoons, but in, in the um, adverts as well, you know, so advertising. There were just so many areas that one could uh, actually make a living in as well. Um, so I, I think, yeah, that certainly would have had a, 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 an impact on his, his natural development as an artist. Uh, um, uh, but I mean, he was, he was just fantastic from the word go, you know, he really was, he, he had that extra, uh, yeah, that X factor, uh, I guess is what we'd call it. You know, when we hear that now, we sort of cringe. Um, but you know, if you forget Simon Cowell and all those nitwits, um, uh, there is such a thing as X Factor where you can't really put your finger on exactly what it is, but this guy is sort of head and shoulders above uh, uh, everybody else uh, um, in the business, or he's he's out on his own, and it's it's an extraordinary and very very special um, talent uh, that is recognised instantly by people with talent. I mean, I remember the Sherlock Holmes page that I was talking about came into the hands of George Macdonald Fraser. Um, the, the writer of the Flashman novels. And he wanted us, he wanted uh, uh, John and myself to do graphic novels from from his books. And again, now that would have been good. That would have been wonderful. That would have been good. Um, and he suggested, he said, look, we'll have to sell this to the publisher, but what we'll need is, is um, a few pages, a few sample pages. Um, and he suggested we did uh, one of the Charge of the Light Brigade. Um, and unfortunately, it was just when John picked up some contract to do something, something. Good. So as this would have been on spec at this moment in time, um, he just didn't. And, and of course, John being John would not have attempted to do it without all the research that would have needed to go into exactly how everybody looked down to the last button on their tunic um at uh at, at the battle um i did write the script for it and that was approved by uh george Macdonald fraser so it, we were just that step and then you know uh in this life uh things happen and suddenly uh uh that's that's put by the wayside but uh yeah looking back there's certainly a regret that we didn't do flashman because that would have been such yeah. a joy as one of the best characters to come out of the last century, that's for sure. And do it properly, you know, unlike the ghastly movie um, that was made. Hmm. Um, bizarrely, uh, uh, scripted by George MacDonald Fraser, so I never, never quite understood why. Um, yeah, there, there was also, John loved the TV series uh, Sharp. Right. Yeah, with Sean I Bean. Think, and yeah, he I did, think I... Yeah, he did a... Um, uh, he did a, an enormous piece of artwork for it, and uh, and when I was there, John still had the the, uh, the VHS tapes, <laughs> you know, because he loved the series, you know, and he would have loved to have done that. So we did a, a big piece on spec, but it never went anywhere. So yeah, so he always had these ideas. He was constantly trying to to generate work, and I think um, to the earlier point about his working class background i think he had this worker ethic that said i need to be in work i'm freelance i don't know where my next job is going to come from right i need to find it and i need to be always looking for for more so um yeah i think that was always there i think that's always be working always be working 
was the, his his attitude. So when he was doing um, uh, strips, like for example, uh, this is Danielle in the early nineteen seventies. Um, he'd be doing, he'd be planning, and so he'd do the thumbnails. He'd put all these up on, on a sheet, and he'd do a week in about two and a half, three days. So that meant that in a week he had another three days in order to do other work. And that's when he would be doing um, full pages of UFO or Mission Impossible for uh, TV action and, and whatever. So he, he always had multiple jobs at the same time. And he would be staying up all hours that he needed to in order to to get these things done. So I really, I think that... Um, it's that fear of not not working, of being out of a job, that uh, I think that may have been one of the driving mechanisms for for him. Yeah, that that would make sense, uh, particularly when I approached him with <laughs> with what looks like a really stupid idea now um, to do um, serializations of uh, Mills and Boone classics. Yeah. <laughs> oh ho. Um, but he immediately said, "Yeah, yeah, I'm in on that," um, and uh, sold the idea. We sold the idea to Mills and Boone, and then um, to the Sun. I, I can never remember whether which way round that was. Whether we sold it to the Sun first or Mills and Boone. It must have been Mills and Boone first. Um, the idea being that um, uh, these uh, comic book adaptations would um, appeal to sort of a younger market. Than, than the their novels did and and that that younger market would then grow into the novels so i think that was the pitch that i hit mills and boone with and they they felt that 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 was a workable idea and then the sun came on board and uh for some reason the sun got it into their head that this was uh all about bonking and very sexual and uh unfortunately as we as we yeah there it like <laughs> Like George, yeah, and no, that is not Mills and Boone. That is no, not, no, 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 no. But they um, thought they were going to get George and Lynn. Probably. I guess they did, and uh, unfortunately, they got well Mills and Boone instead. Um, and we were about three quarters of the way through a story, or halfway through a story, when uh, it was dropped after the editor said to me, "When's the sex coming into this story?" Uh, to which I said, yeah, they hey, thought they were getting Mills and Bonking rather than Mills and Boone. <laughs> that, that's it. Uh, <laughs> Which uh, I, the, the funny thing about that is that it allowed me to buy my first house because the contract from the Sun was such that I was able to go to the estate agent and show it. Um, and on the day that all the paperwork went through, um, uh, the Sun cancelled his trip, uh, <laughs> but it got me on the housing market. So thank you, Mills and Boone, and uh, and and the Sun, I guess, uh, for that. I, 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 I always always love the, the 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 thing he said in one of his interviews that um people that uh, him and his wife had never met before assumed that his wife would walk around naked in the house and she was the <laughs> uh, the model for Lynn in George and Lynn. And he's like, no, 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 no. This, this comes out of my imagination. Seriously. Oh no, but he, she she did model for him a little bit though. Oh, did she? Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like yeah. The first time I met John Proctor, we was having a we were sat together for dinner at a UCAC awards thing. And uh, I sat there with another couple of eyes. We all laid and said how much we like John's work and that. And he said, "Yeah, when you know, I used to tie her up and take photos of her." Point at Julia, who got extremely embarrassed. But yeah, he did. He didn't do it all out of his head. <laughs> no, he, he mentioned that one time, and we were out for a for a bite. He, he said, "Yeah, I sometimes use Julia the modern." She's like, "Yeah, he's had me tied up every week." Yeah, just look, look. The, yes. the, week, the week I I was brought in on the strip, um, I actually met my wife to be, uh, whose name was Jane, uh, and it was unlikely that we should meet because she was from um, the Midwest in the US, and I was from Liverpool. Uh, there was no connecting point between us, so it was kind of a magical week that suddenly I, I was signed up to do Jane, um, and indeed met my own uh, love of my life, Jane. So. Uh, it is indeed a funny old life that we lead. So. Um, yeah. one, of, one of the things I, I, I wanted to talk to Sean about was um, 
the uh the the John was one of those people who's as comfortable painting as he was doing uh black and white line work and yeah. uh as as someone who does black and white line work and <laughs> and paints and seems to be as comfortable uh with, with with either i wonder if if you had any insights into into john's style and 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 how that and how that worked because you know you 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 look at some of his judge dread work um and there's so many uh fantastic color combinations you know uh, my, my my favorite is always where half the face is one color and then the other half is a completely yeah. contrasting color and that that's just pure john burns and I, I i wondered if you had any kind of insight into um in, in into um well i think uh, one of the reasons why he liked doing his own color it's like mm. tim said before when jane started being colored in by somebody else for john to see that in the paper every day must be very disappointing every time so um, you know, if he, if he keeps total control by doing his own color, then you know that's, it's much better. I mean, I don't, I do paint comics occasionally, but they're very labor intensive. John obviously had a very much quicker way of doing it. You know, like you say, he knew what he was doing. Whereas every time I start a new page, it's like starting again. So I think you know, you know, he likes total control, um, and also I think he started. You know, when he start, first started doing the the weird color stuff, was when he's doing countdown in the early 70s and that was when all of a sudden comics were printed better well eagle had always been around so he'd been doing stuff in there but you could um you know what you what you put on the paper would then tra translate very easily into the printed version you know before then it would have been a you know, processed color and it wouldn't have it wouldn't have come out how he wanted it to come out i, I, uh, I also think that was the time he, he he said he got a color tv so uh yeah yeah maybe yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and, uh... <clears throat> Yeah, sorry, sorry. The, um, the the story tells um, about Countdown was that um, um, in the early uh, uh, in the late sixties they got color television, and if you have a look at color television from from that time, the blacks weren't black; they were other colors, and it gave them the idea of putting mm -hmm. uh, a color into the black that wasn't black. So uh, so that's where that sort of came about on Countdown. But <clears throat> having said that, I've just been looking at Wrath of the Gods recently, which he did in the early 60s. So that was originally done, that was in Boy's World. It was originally done by Ron Hamilton, uh, the first story, uh, and then John took over uh, and did it. And if you have a look, there are some of that, those same ideas, not as extreme, but very similar ideas about uh, how to use colour and also to use, sometimes you would do a whole strip and it would be variations on on one colour so that it would be, if it was primarily greens, you'd do variations on different shades. So you would do the uh, the blackout artwork and then the, uh, the watercolours that you put in or, or whatever you're using, they were, um, uh, it made it much quicker, he said, <laughs> because if you're using, you know, if you're on a deadline, you know, just make sure that it's uh, uh, monochromatic in that way <laughs> so that it, 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 you got through it quicker. Um, but yeah, but that was uh, something that he, he really continued throughout his career and it became a sort of um, a part of his style, an indicator that he'd, he'd actually worked on it. Uh, and played with it yeah. but I, I think one of the other things that there's a difference between uh, for example if, if you look at uh, this is uh, Zatari uh, it's even got drawings on the back as well um, but uh, if you look at it's, it's black outline with uh, with colour in, uh, in, inside it so, so the black really comes out and it's very much like his his line work that he does. And uh, uh, I had a conversation with uh, with John because he was an admirer of uh, Tony Weir, who was an artist on Matt Marriott and, and, and other things, and he, he, who was an illustrator as well, also lived in Cornwall. Um, and they were, uh, we were talking about the idea of, I once was in a library and John rings me up 
in, in the library. And we have this whole conversation just about line work and painting. Because he had been influenced by, as we've mentioned earlier, a lot of those artists from Saturday Evening Post and uh, Robert Forsett and, uh, and all the others. And um, he wanted to find a way of going from something that was line work to something that was fully, fully painted. Um, and that's something that if you see his work on 2000 AD on Judge Dredd, and then the early Nikolai Dante. And then just after that, you'll see the transition because he decided to go to something that was fully painted so that the, the line work has, has gone. Now, this was for a, a, a commission. This is a small sketch he did. Um, and, uh, and that was the thing. I think that what he did was is that in his career, at the end of his career, he became like those illustrators that he so admired um, at, at the beginning, but he was doing it in a, in a comic strip media. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a different way of looking at light, I think, because if you're, if you're putting an outline on a, on a character, you're defining um, the, whole sh the whole shape. But when you're doing a painting like this with no outlines, you, it's def, um, the shape is defined by the light and not by the line. And I, I think this is something that when I talk about him developing as, a, as an artist and evolving as he was going through, I think, um, uh, I think that's undervalued. And I, I know that a lot of people, certainly people I've taught to they preferred it when he had that sort of line style because it was a style that they grew up with where he would have all these big swooping lines to show action and um, and if you have a look in later in his career he he got rid of all of that because he was dealing um um in a, in a different tone in a different way i think with the characters and with the art and with the with the light um, and also with the storytelling. He was given, um, I think, uh, a lot more space. I mean, Robbie's scripts for uh, for Nikolai and also uh, Keck W's for, for The Order, they actually gave him a, uh, more pages and more space to include um, uh, 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 grace moments. Um, that he could draw. So then you see that on these pages, the um, he would change colors and the colors themselves would, um, would help communicate the emotions of the characters at those particular times. So as, whereas before saying countdown and, um, uh, and in the, the looking strips, he may have put in these bold colors in order to attract you, in order to, um, uh, in order to show off, if you like, in a way, um, uh, and to excite you, I think that his use of color later on in life was much more subtle and nuanced, um, and I, I think gave a, a greater emotional depth to to his work. So, uh, so this is, if you like. Um, um, uh, one of the things that I want to show in this in this book um, that I'm working on, I, I want people to uh, understand that it wasn't just he wasn't just a one hit wonder. He wasn't he was constantly developing as a as an artist and as a, a storyteller. Uh, well, actually, which I think is great because so many people, you know, they, they get to a certain point and it's it it just grinds them out. Um, you know. It, We've seen examples with, within the industry where people are just ground down by the by by the work, but but John was on top of the work. You know, he was he 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 wasn't he wasn't laying down and let the work grind him down. He was powering through, you know, right through to the end. I think that's great, Robbie. Yeah, I actually had that conversation with him one time. About 
if he had kind of moved on from the the line work and the painting, but it always was a you know a, a distinct black line at points to just doing straightforward painting. And um, it was something as as Paul said there. It was he was trying to do. He was trying. He said he was he was trying to move away from the actual. Um, and just do it with paints and, and light and stuff like this rather than using the, a sort of inked line. Um, um, because I think this is, I don't know if anybody can see this, and obviously, this is hardly great, hardly great radio. Um, uh, but every single panel is a four panel page, it's at the end of it, it's at the end of a, 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 a big long storyline. Um, Three of the panels are all just fully painted, but the final one, the one there, is all just done in one sort of sepia tone almost with but with John's ink work on it. Um but I think that was probably one of the final panels he I, I'd ever seen him do with that. He then just kind of moved on to just trying to do everything with paint. I know that's probably not um and so you're right. He was always evolving. It was something he, he wanted to move on for. Because at one point, I, I I I tried to. I used to love his black and white artwork, and I tried to. I asked him why we were still doing Dante or the or the Bendati Vendetta at the time. I asked him, "Would you ever fancy trying doing something in black and white?" And he he wasn't really interested. And I think I get the sense that he had he had done that before, and he was enjoying he was enjoying just the the sort of more well, illustrative painting, as Mike called it, but he, he was enjoying that style more. He didn't really want to, you know, go back to the black, you know, even just for a one-off story. He seemed he's happy to be moving in the direction he was moving in. So, I mean, I suspect just like artists, all artists, all writers, all creative people, you always want to be evolving and moving on. And, yeah, the very fact that John reached the grand old age that he did and was still pushing himself in other directions is just, you know, Again, it, it says a lot for just the, the sheer passion he had for his artwork mm. and storytelling. Well, well, I was literally about to say that word because um, throughout all his stuff, it doesn't matter what he's doing, the storytelling is so unbelievably solid. Like, there's there's never... I, I don't think I've ever read a panel of John Burns's work where I've been confused or or have had to work out what is happening. So he, even as his style is evolving, the, the tools that he's using is, is changing, he just had this incredible ability to tell a story with pictures. I mean, uh, uh, Tim, mm. it, it, when, when, when doing sort of newspaper um, strips, you, you're very constrained both in terms of script and art, but but just looking at, at um, even something like, you know, Jane or, or, or George and Lynn or, 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 or um, you know, he, he did bits of Modesty Blaze and, and, and whatnot. The amount that he packs in to each of those panels is just remarkable, isn't it? It really is. Uh, I mean, I was always conscious of keeping the word count down just so that I wasn't blocking out his wonderful art. Um, and it was quite easy to do that, actually keep it down because his, his pictures told the story so well. Um, it's, it's, I mean, there's such a beauty to it um, in, in every respect. Uh, it is, I mean, John really should be taught at schools. You know, I, I do a lot of work in schools, uh, uh, workshops, showing kids how to um, create characters, draw and write and uh, uh, the kind of thing that you would assume the education system might see as being valuable um, to giving children self-belief. Um, and I really think, my God, would it not be wonderful to have uh, John as um, a tutor in those in, in schools across the UK, across the bloody world, um, just showing one aspect, one wonderful, beautiful, glorious, shining aspect of art. Uh, and storytelling. I mean, it's just quite, I, I can't exaggerate, you know, hey, I've worked in comics for more than 50 years, and uh, yet here I am, I can't exaggerate how good John's work is. It's just so, so extraordinary. Um, he, 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 I mean, he fully deserves to be um, along, named alongside people like Ron Embleton, Don Lawrence, you know, just uh, for 
Yeah, Arthur Rackham and, uh, you yeah, know, Norman absolutely. Rockwell, as, as you yeah. said. Yeah, I, I mean, he's up there with, you know, totally with the greats. Um, uh, <laughs> God knows what he'd be saying if he was in on this conversation. Um, <laughs> tell, yeah, he'd be, he'd be telling us all to shut up and be sort of, you know, getting curmudgeonly about it. Just to prove all the stuff about um, being a curmudgeon or anything like that, it, it's just to disprove it. Um, uh my other half, Deborah, who coincidentally used to actually work, she she used to edit Sonic the Comic and other stuff at, and at Marvel UK. And she used to work with jo the other John Burns, John's nephew. Yeah. Um, oh, she, my she, God, what a colorist is John. Yeah, yeah, no, you're brilliant. Yeah. So she used to work with him. But she, well, it was my birthday one time, she got in touch, unknown to me, with John um, to ask if he, she could buy a page of artwork from him for my birthday and oh. he ended up sending her three pages and never took any money from it at all so it was oh. um one of them says on it happy birthday robbie don't too much don't don't drink too much in your birthday remember my scripts that's <laughs> um but oh. so yeah they, and they are literally they're on they're on my wall mm. uh where i work so there's not you know pretty much a day passes that i'll, I'll stand and look at look at them for at least couple of minutes just marvel at you know some of the you know because i think what always gets me is when you're up when you see the full size artwork when it when it's printed it can look incredibly detailed but some some of it when when you see it full size some of the brush strokes that look exceptionally detailed when they're shrunk down in print they're actually quite simple and elegant um just when you when you see them at full size it's uh it's, it's just a, a marvel basically did he ever bring you into a strip? Because you have a face. I'm looking at your face, and there is a <laughs> face that would fit into any strip. Oh yeah, the the handsome leading man. Thanks. That's. that's uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't um, going. To, I wasn't going to suggest that, but uh, yeah, yeah. John yeah. Did put me into Jane at some point, and and I, I, yeah. I was very um, flattered that my face, as it was happily all those years ago, um, features in yeah. in a few of his strips. Um, I don't. Um, I don't think he. Did. I'm yeah. sorry. I don't. I don't think he ever put me in anything. But um, unless it was something insulting that he never bothered <laughs> telling me about, I don't know. I think you would know. You would yeah. definitely know. So. I know other artists have, have dropped me into the odd thing here and there, and um, yeah. most of the time it's been fairly. You know, I won't go as far as to say complimentary, but it's not been. <laughs> it's, just, it's not been too embarrassing. I do have a nice collection myself from uh, everybody from Charlie Adlard, myself as a zombie, through to uh, my appearance with Jane. Yeah, uh, although, Jane Strip. interestingly, just to go off on a slight tangent, every now and again, I did think Nikolai Dante and the odd panel had a vague resemblance to John. And I did wonder ah. if it's, you know, is he using himself as a. Yeah. Is he using himself well, for that? Well, he did have. Um, if we can see the top one there. Yeah, I can see it's that. Not, it, it's not the best, you know. Maybe a a younger, slightly handsomer John, but it, it's <laughs> um. Well, not that um, not that he was John's studio looking man. Um, yeah. Yeah, every now and again, I would catch I would catch a, a panel and think that just looks a bit, a bit a bit too much like John every now and again, you know. Um, Sorry, Paul, what, what are you saying? Yeah, in John's studio, he was surrounded by three mirrors, and um, large mirrors. So one in front, one behind, and one to the to the side, ah. so that he could, um, whenever he needed to have a look at the the light and. Uh, uh, or his hands, or or any object, he could just put it up, and he would be able to see it from those. Also, he had a, a tiny camera um, that he would take reference photos of his of his hands. So, famously, if you have a look at the um, all the uh, his strips, there are. Um, uh, lots of things where you see the hands coming towards you or uh, all in these strange sort of configurations. And that's that's all John, you know, taking these little snaps of his hands and then having a look at it. And then 
So we used to use reference like that. I mean, you also you had a set of these as well. Yeah, that's artist right. Fairbone books because I I use them a lot, and they're just you know photos of people acting stuff out through artist yeah. reference. Occasionally, yeah, in Jane and other things, you'd see. Hold on a minute, I recognise that person there, and I've <laughs> yeah. used that same actor in something I've done as well. Brilliant! Yeah, if you're a fan good. of. Brilliant if you're a fan of 70s hairdos. Yeah. yeah. Well, at the beginning of the books, it says they purposely photograph people in hairstyles and clothes that wouldn't date. Yeah. <laughs> but they certainly mm. did. They said a lot of things yeah. in the 70s that uh, <laughs> haven't necessarily come yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, Sean, I'm going to bring things to a close now, but What's your um, what's your lasting impression of John and his work? Is is is, is there a, a a moment when you talk that stands out, or is there a moment in his in his artwork that that has always stayed with you? Um, I think he was you know, he's always been my favourite British artist, comic artist. Um, and like I said before, I was really only ever into that more bombastic Marvel stuff. But he was the one the one British guy that stuff I always really liked because it looked effortless and elegant and glamorous and you know. He could draw everything. And that was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, we did work together once. Um, I did a, I edited a magazine for the Lakes Comic Art Festival, a big newspaper um, with spirit stories in there. And John drew a page for that. He did like a, a one page spirit story and he gave me the artwork afterwards, which was really nice of him. Mm. And also in the package, he put in another few, a couple of Jane strips and a couple of Seeker strips and bits and bobs. He was always very generous like that. Yeah. Who's just the best? Yeah, yeah. You, you just... yeah. Uh, same question to you, Robbie. Is is there a moment that stands out for you? Um, I think I'll go with that that first big double page splash that um that uh he did for the the first Nikolai Dante series we did together. Just because I suddenly realised, whoa. I'm working with John Burns here. I've made it. I'm in the big leagues. Um, I think, but I mean, there was, you know, there was, I worked with him for so long in Dante and there was so much, there's so much beautiful artwork out there. And as I say, little moments are just, not, not even little moments, but just, I think I said it earlier, it was probably one of the most satisfying, you know, creative collaborations, artists and writer working in something. And I just, I completely trusted him. I knew everything was going to look brilliant. Hopefully he trusted me and he liked, you know, we, I think we got on. He seemed to uh, like the cut of my nib, if, 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 if I can say it that way. And yeah, I think we just got on quite well. And it's, uh, I, I only, I'm always sad in some ways that the last few years I've been, you know, I, I've been sort of, not involved in comics very much, and I, I hadn't really been in touch with him for a little while. And I only learned he had retired uh, just um, a couple of weeks before I then learned he had passed away. And I'd, I think it was just before, I thought it was just before Christmas or something. I learned he'd retired, and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll give John a phone in the new year and say hello and just say, you know, happy retirement. And you know, it was a, you know privilege to work with you, honour and a privilege to work with you. And I, you know, I never got the the uh, the chance, I'm afraid. So yeah, just uh yeah, it's just been it was as I say, it was terrific to work with them on uh, you know, one of the comic strips that is you know, you know, probably my favourite of the own my, my own things I've worked with to to yeah, to work with John on. It was fantastic. It, 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 Tim, what, what, is, is is there a moment that stands out for you with, with John? Uh, yeah, every single moment that, you know, <laughs> uh, that I was lucky enough to work with him. Uh, and that, that, of course, goes all the way back to uh, 1964, reading Kelpie as a boy. You know, that was with me through the time working with him. Uh, you know, uh, what is it? There's that phrase, you should never meet your heroes. And, uh, you know, I, I would uh, take issue with that. Um, uh, all of my heroes that I've met have been... Uh, an absolute, well, all except one, who I won't mention, <clears throat> uh, Mike McCartney. Uh, but uh, everybody else has been absolutely fabulous, uh, uh, especially John. And a, a particular moment to pull out would be, um, I've always had a, a passion and love for fairy tales, uh, the old fairy tales. 
And um, while working at Marvel Comics, um, I uh, pitched the idea of doing a sequels to fairy tales comic, uh, which was going ahead, uh, Great Guns. And the first person that I contacted uh, because of his work in uh, Robin all those years ago, uh, his fairy tale work, uh, was John. Um, and I teamed him up with uh, one of uh, our writers there, uh, uh, Alan Castle. And they turned out three pages that, oh my gosh, the three pages that are just some of the best comic book work ever seen in the universe. I mean, it's that it's that good. It, it, it Again, tr it's transporting and you're back in that glorious world, um, but taking the story up um, two days after uh, Sleeping Beauty awoke, um, only to realise that uh, the second part of the curse was about to kick in, that she would now have to stay awake for the next hundred years. Um, uh, anyway, thanks to Marvel going bankrupt, um, that was uh, thrown in the air, uh, not before I captured it myself and uh, took it home with me. Um, and uh, a few years later, I got the opportunity to start just such a comic. Um, the idea being that John would be a huge part of it. Uh, the comic was called Blue Moon, and it was indeed sequels to fairy tales uh, with uh, all the main characters you would suspect. Um, unfortunately, John was, uh, I, I, again, I lose track of what John was working on at the time, but he was working on something so closely that uh, Blue Moon um, came and went after a few years um, without being able to bring John on board with it, which was a, a real drag. But those three pages that he did, I mean, you know, what do you got to do to prove yourself? Um, they are so wonderful. I often take them into schools and show kids um, those pages and encourage children to take the story on. What happened next? What happened next? And they are beautiful for doing that, particularly in primary schools, because they totally capture the imagination. And boy, that's what John did for uh, 60 plus years. Uh, capture the imagination of all ages. Um, we love you, John. Absolutely. Um, uh, regardless of what you might say, you you were amazing. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm going to come to Paul finally because I, I, I did John underneath the curmudgeonly don't talk about this stuff. Blah, blah, blah. Did he understand how much he was appreciated and admired and 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 loved? Well, I. Uh I think at the end, yes, um, there was, um, I mean, you were talking about, you know, moments and I always, uh, so I'm in the studio, I'm looking around, I'm poking through all the drawers, opening everything up, trying to find things. I found a piece of artwork um, that he'd done for the 1970s and um uh, I, I looked at it and it says, oh, this character looks like you. And um, and it, he, he came over, he had a look at it, and he says, you read too, many, too much into this, Paul. It's just a job. It's just a job. And, and that was always his, if you like, surface action, surface reaction to everything. Um, but really the, the fact that he kept, you know, kept wanting me to carry on or that he would then send me a package of, of copies, you know, he says, Oh, this is a commission I did. Uh, here's a copy of it um, for the book. You know, he was always thinking about it and he was always, he understood that the interest was there. He was always getting commissions towards the end of his life. And, um, and also uh, Colin Brown, started the uh, John Burns art on Facebook. Um, and he and Julia communicated um, with that back and forth um, uh, all the time. So towards the end of the, his career, yes, he did understand that he was loved by all the, the gentlemen here as well, um, by the people that he, he, he worked with. But it was like he was so um, self-depreciating, so humble that he couldn't, he didn't really, 
you know, uh, uh, show that he he appreciated it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the curmudgeonly is, I think, is just like a, a, it's his way of you know of not showing the emotion that that's there underneath. So, but the emotion was there, and he showed it through his art, through his penmanship, and through his actions. You know, through his generosity to to everybody that he met. So, um, yeah, always judge a person by their actions, not by what they say, I think. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. I, I think that's a, a fantastic moment to end on. Um, I, I think the tragedy here is is the world was robbed of John Burns on Sherlock Holmes and Flashman. <laughs> and all these, all these yeah. I, he, he could have probably filled another lifetime with, um, with the amount of projects that never came to... Um, to fruition but yeah well, well we only have to pour up with the five or six thousand pages that he actually <laughs> <laughs> darn it we'll just darn have it. to make do yeah wonderful well it it, it I, I mean i mean much missed um artist and but what an absolute fantastic legacy and 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 hopefully for those who, who are listening and watching um we've given just a little bit of flavor uh, of, of of not just the work but also the man. So um, I want to thank all of you for, for for your for your recollections and your stories because this has been this has been a real treat to get to know John um, Burns through the people that knew him. So um, yeah, much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs>